<laughs> Welcome back to the Cube. Here we are at um, the O'Reilly Fluent Conference. It's coming up towards the end of day one. We've been here since this morning, since the keynotes, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. It's, you're in the Cube. What we do is we go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise, we wrangle up the smartest people we can find at the events and bring them on the Cube, ask them the questions that you would like to ask them, and really try to get a feel for what's going on, what's the mood, what are the hot topics, and bring that back to you. We invite you to join the conversation. The Twitter handle for the event is hashtag FluentConf. So go ahead and tweet us in some um, questions and join us, and, uh, and we welcome. So like the... And, Welcome Dan Safford to theCUBE. Welcome Dan. Thank you, great to be here. Dan does all kinds of things. He's the director of interactive design at Smart, Smart Design, as well as an author of a new book. So tell us a little bit about your new book, the fourth book I see. For, fourth book of mine, it's, it's called Micro Interactions, and it's all about all the small details and small pieces of functionality that are around the big features uh, that people tend to forget about, but actually can make a really huge difference in the in how people feel about the product that they're designing. A lot of people uh, tend to think like, oh, well, if I, if I just nail these big features that people will love my product, but it's actually not true. Like, people really, uh, people, people will tolerate your product, sure, it, it can be usable, but it's not, uh, it's not necessarily gonna be beloved unless you nail some of, those, some of those key details. Right, so it begs the obvious question. Give us some, some examples. So the, 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 most, uh, the most frequent example that, that everyone thinks about is turning the ringer off on your phone. Like nobody Which buys- I was just doing before we went live. Exactly, here. yeah, to turn I mean, the you do it, you do it you know, 10 times a day, you know. Um, and it's not, it's not a feature that anyone's gonna buy the phone for. I just expect, wow, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to turn the ringer off on my phone, but it can make a huge difference. Like in some of the old phones, you had to go back, you had to go through like 10 different levels of menus to turn the ringer off and then you know then Apple's like no no you just flick this little switch and it turns off but it can still it can still cause some problems I, I talk about in the book uh, this famous example from a year or so ago when this guy at the symphony turned his ringer off and thought that it turned all the alarms off but he was sitting in the front row and one of his alarms went off and ruined the whole symphony just because he <laughs> didn't understand how the micro interaction worked right um, right and so, uh, so these little things can just make this big difference. Right, so I have to say, this is, a, this is an area near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. I spent a long time ago in a different world, 10 years in the consumer electronics industry, and I cannot mm -hmm. tell you how many hours I spent trying to teach salespeople how to show people how to program a VCR. And <laughs> literally, the, the starting yeah. point was always the flashing 12, which all of us still had. So one of the debates yeah. that would always come up, and there's very different design methodologies, mm -hmm. get your input, was kind of like, you know, the menus versus buttons. You know, single single use things versus do I have to drill down five steps to turn the volume down? Yeah. What's kind of the best practices around around it, something like that? Well, I mean, for micro interactions, you want to do what most you want to like expose the thing that most people are doing all the time. So if if a majority of people are are trying to set the clock most of the time, you want to pull that functionality out and make it make it as available as quickly as possible. That being said, if a lot of people are doing a lot of different things, man, you don't want a ton of buttons because then your interface looks like it's really complicated. So right. it's always this dance between um, perceived simplicity versus kind of functional simplicity. Because functional simplicity, yeah, everything's got a button and I just press it and that happens. But then you have a row of buttons, so right. what do you do? Right. So it's always a it's always a tension that designers are trying to resolve. Yeah. So, so uh, and, and before you came on, I was looking at your LinkedIn page, and you've got a, a deck on there uh, comparing MySpace to MySpace to Vegas in 2007. So, yeah. I, you know, it's always interesting to kind of go back. It looks like Vegas hasn't changed that much. But I'm curious to get your perspective um, on kind of what was the theme there and how, how have things changed? I can't believe we're, you know, six years from 2007. No one's even on MySpace right. anymore. I don't even know if it's around anymore. It's, it's still kind around, of yeah. I, I, I mean, the, the, the interesting thing was that, that MySpace for a long time was the punching bag for bad design. Like, you know, you looked at MySpace and went, wow, this, this is just a wreck. This is, you know, how could anyone, you know, how could anyone have ever designed this? Um, and sometimes it, 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 it leads you to believe, well, you know, sometimes designers, you know, think about what is, what is good design with a capital G, capital D, and not like thinking about what, um, what 
normal people really enjoy doing or really like their, you know. So MySpace became this whole thing about personal expression. Like, you know, I'm going to make this page the way I want it. And, you know, you professional designer may think this is ugly, but it is an expression of me. Um, and you see some of this still reflected now in, in what people are thinking about uh, with with my, with uh, Facebook. It's like, oh, this is, you know, this is such a horrible design. Like, why is it like this? And, um, and yeah, and so it bugs a lot of professional designers, but, uh, but uh, you know, billions of people use it and it's and it, it, it suits their needs right it's, it's right. what they're interested in doing so. and, and we're also in this world which I think is fascinating when, when you have uh, devices or software or whatever and you put it in the hands of a kid I've got a bunch of uh, rugrats that aren't rugrats anymore uh -huh. at home and you know the way that they interact just instinctively it, or appears to be instinctively with devices today and the, and the way that they discover functionality versus you give you know, the new iPhone to mom or grandma, and, and she doesn't have a clue. I don't know if it's a function of we're afraid to break something as older folks or because clearly no one has ever read user manuals, so I don't think yeah. that's really part of it. But how, how, you know, how do you see from a design professional the way that some of these things as they get more and more complex, more and more functionality, expose that in a way that people can actually discover, use, and, and take advantage? Yeah, I mean, there, there's... I forget who said it, but like any any technology that comes, he said something like any technology that comes out after you're 30 is, is magic <laughs> or something like you know. Is, is, we used to talk about the is, FM chip back in the Mitsubishi days. We yeah, exactly. About what that is, stands for. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so I mean, there is that like you know things things are definitely becoming more complex, more complicated. Um, but on the other side, there I mean there are people really struggling to make things simple and really you know trying to get that right balance between giving you enough things to that you can be that you can control something or you know while still making it simple enough for anyone to kind of pick up and use uh, and we've I think we've gotten a lot better but certainly um, certainly there are lots of things that are you know dis, you know discoverable and very difficult to like just uncover I talk a little bit about this in the book um, like invisible triggers these things that like you know, you accidentally stumble upon or you read about it and you're like, oh my God, I never knew that I could, you know, I could tap this twice right. and it brings up, you know, a little scrubber so that I can control, you know, where in the podcast I am. Right. Like those things are, are immensely not discoverable. Um, but they did it for the service that most people aren't ever going to use that, right? I mean, it was only for like power users, so they hid it behind like a secret gesture, right? Right. You know, and if you really were interested in it, you could, you know, look it up or you know somehow stumble over it somehow. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a really it's a really fine fine balance to to figure out what it is that you hide like that and what is it that you expose. Yeah. Uh, but it's yeah. Well, it's, one of my favorites, uh, I, a long time ago, I, I found some money in a budget to take some training classes. And then I went and took a Microsoft Word class, and this is years ago. And the most useful thing I learned, which I'd never had a clue, was how tab stops work. And it uh -huh. has saved me hours and hours and hours of right. time lining up numbers and lining up things using the tab stop function. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you're supposed to ever figure that out short of the short kajillions of, of menus the, the, and this, that, and the, the other. The class, right, right? taking the class yeah. and nobody takes classes anymore. So let's go back to your book. Are there some really core design tenets that people need to, to keep in mind? Because clearly there's no right answer, right? There's the, there's the Apple way where they're basically defining your experience mm -hmm. in a way that they think is the best for you. And then there's kind of the Android way, which is, you know, we've got kind of a framework and lots of people exactly. can take different interpretations. So looking at your book and, mm -hmm. and you know, what are some of the yeah. really key design criteria that people need to keep in, so in the, mind? There's a, there's a couple of different things that I, that I kind of call out in the book. The, the first is, is, um, is really to, uh, uh, to bring the data forward because there's a lot of times where you're looking at an app or you're looking at um, your device and you're like, I really need just this one piece of information. What is it? And I don't want to have to go searching into the app and find it and look for, you know, look for the weather. You know, why doesn't my, why doesn't on my iPhone, why doesn't the, the weather data icon update itself to show me what the actual <laughs> weather is? I have to go <laughs> in to and really do it, right? <laughs> you know, so, uh, so there's bringing the data forward, which is a really nice, what, what is the thing, what is the piece of information that you could prevent people from having to go in and find it? So that's a, that's a really important one. Um, Another one I talk about is, is don't start from zero. 
you almost always know something about the user or the environment or the day or the time or, or you know something about the person who's, who's using the app and use that to make the product better. Uh, I talk a lot about, uh, and I'm a big advocate for the, for the app Waze, which is a navigation app. Yeah, and it's um, a good one. Love it because I, I turn it on and it notice, you know, when I'm at my office and I it's at six o'clock, I turn the app on and it pops up something and says, oh, hi, Dan, are, you're, are you going home right now? <laughs> and it uses what it already knew about me. It said, great, you know, every, you know, every day you do this same thing. I'm just gonna present that as an option to you. Let's, uh, you know, let's, you know, just do this. And so I don't have to dig in, go to the navigation area and choose home. It just noticed the behavior I was already doing, which is great. Um, and a third one was um, use what's often overlooked. I mean, we have, you know, as designers and developers, tons of stuff that we can put on an interface, like another, you can always put another button right, or an overlay or something like that. But w what's already there that I could use that, uh, that, that that's already existing so I don't have to add one more thing to the screen. Um, so I talk about like how uh, Chrome, when you search for a word in Chrome, it uses the scroll bar. It shows you in the scroll bar, like here's the instances of that word right in this page. And it's brilliant. I mean, it uses something that's already there. I, they didn't have to add another pop-up box or something. Right. It's like, there are 13 instances. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. It, it's really brilliant. Right. Great. So some of the things you're seeing here in, in the changes in, in the application development space and the technologies that are evolving. and you know, how is that really changing design? And the one that, that you, if you can speak specifically to, you know, we, we've got these mobile devices and, mm -hmm. you know, not only are they fantastic ways to, to, to transmit an application and to provide information, but I think the big, the big delta is that they're giving information back. I mean, this thing will even tell you what the barometric pressure is, I guess, if there's, an app, if, if there's a reason that you've got an app for that. Talk a little bit about that, and, and I think the other kind of interesting thing is intelligence design, and as you said, things learning about your behaviors to make hopefully the uh, the better button show up higher on the top of the list. So talk a little bit about how yeah. that world has changed and and what it means for design. Yeah. So the 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 first question about um, you know how is kind of how is technology evolving and and, and being uh, involved. I mean, certainly with micro interactions, micro interactions and uh, are, and the history of technology are basically intertwined. All the stuff that you take for granted now on your on your phone or on your laptop, those were all once novel um, micro interactions, things like cut and paste and the scroll bar even. Those were like things that weren't there. So, and now that we're like in this mobile world, we're still adding to micro interactions. As technology changes, there are more micro interactions added to, uh, to navigate and to think about them. I mean, Think about uh, think about when ha and it, like when um, well, when Wi-Fi came in, how it was such a uh, how do I connect to a Wi-Fi network? Right, I mean, right. it's such an abstract thing. Right. It's like, but now there's you know now you do it almost unthinkingly with right. your phone. It's it's but somebody had to design and think about that. And I think that we're um, we're definitely moving into uh, moving into an area where the designs and and the the development are so tightly coupled that you can, uh, that it's really interesting what, you know, uh, a, a lot of the things that are making these micro interactions possible now are the new tools that developers have and designers have to, to prototype and test these things and to take risks like doing things like, um, you know, slowly over time, you know, for instance, changing the, uh, making something that was once a button with a label just down to a button or maybe just down to a small icon that over time as you use it, it gets smarter about, hey, you, you're now an expert user of this thing. You, the, the app can adapt to use over time. And I think that's a really fascinating thing. How do you turn these things that are otherwise um, very, um, you know, they, they come out of the box the same as everyone, but now this is my phone, it's adapted to me. Like the Waze example, you know, Waze now knows me and that that's something very valuable. It knows a lot about my um, knows a lot about my preferences and stuff like that. Without me having to tell it, it it's just making these like really smart guesses. Right. But, I mean, it's creepy, uh, you know, <laughs> in, in, in its own way. But uh, but it's definitely uh, it's definitely valuable. The things that the things that people can tell about you just from uh, 
j just from your behavior is really interesting. And I think there's, there's some great stuff I talk in the book about, like how do you prevent human error doing this? And things like Google Mail, uh, the Gmail stuff is great. I mean, you write, you know, hey, I've, I've, in, you know, I've attached this file. And then if you don't attach it, it brings right, up a right. thing saying, hey, you forgot this which is amazing, but man, it's like, oh wait, <laughs> Google's reading all my mail. Right, right. So um, Everything works better just for the folks out there if you just say yes. Just just exactly. say yes just and say actually yes. use it all as an integrated system. It all right. works a lot better. And the reality is even if you say no, they know anyway unless you leave your phone at home and most right. of us don't do that. So talk a little bit about the, uh, about the future and some of the exciting things. I mean, we talked about it briefly, but you know, we had our first guest today wearing Google Glass. So. So clear, you know, wearable, and, and of course we're already wearing our phones uh, almost 24/7. Yeah. Anyway, how that impacts design, and the other thing I think that's pretty interesting with a lot of new apps and, and, and uh, apps today is is really how they leverage other apps and pull together all these open APIs to deliver really what's already out there, but's potentially packaged in a new and an innovative way right. to deliver mm -hmm. specific value uh, for the for the design of that application. Yeah. And how that impacts design when you're really pulling from not only your own stuff, but other apps via APIs as well. Yeah, I mean the we're entering a really neat era where I mean I mean I've actually heard Google developers say like, oh Google Glass is the first micro interaction device. I mean it is it's it's only meant for these really short tiny bursts of functionality and that's that's really fascinating and we see that you know with the with the pebble watch you see that with internet you know all the internet of things all these all these little objects that now they they do one thing and they do it well um, and that's really i think that's going to be a really fascinating um, a really fascinating thing especially when they as you were saying they start to pull from one another and learn from each other how to how to evolve um, there's uh, there's some work being done now, like with with like a robotic cloud, where you know robots are learning from each other as as they go about doing their work, which is how which is how. brilliant. Be careful, yeah. right? But but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a little scary. You know, paging Skynet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, but uh, uh, that so so that's that. I forget what the second. What was the second part of your question about? Um, well, it was well. We had the, oh, the about the APIs. And the APIs. Like that. Well, yeah, yeah, like you said, because all these apps are working together, really, to de you know, to deliver something uh, that's yeah, unique. I, I mean, I think it's. I mean, it's a it's a great time to be a designer in 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 one sense, in that you know, and developers, and that yeah, there's this this awesome toolkit now that we have that's just you know provided you know for free, and I'll put that in quotes because you know as you as you we've seen you know examples of you know google and twitter and, and other people pulling their apis for various kinds of projects if you've built stuff on top of that man your whole your whole business collapse your whole app right. goes away right. um, so it's always uh, you know it, it's always tenuous when you do that i mean you are relying on on somebody else for for a especially if it's a major piece of your functionality that being said, the the toolkit is so impressive that it's hard. You know, I I'm not going to build my own Twitter. Right, I'm not right, going to build my own right, maps. You right. know, we've seen what happens when 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 Apple tried to build their own maps, and you know, and the comparison was like, wow, jarring. Right. Um, but you know, and I think you know, Apple did look at that and say, wow, you know, we need this key piece of we need to build this ourselves. But it's not it's not an easy thing when it's you know so. Uh, so powerful and so freely available. Right, uh, right. But I think you know, as as designers and developers, it's just a, you know, it's a really cool time to have that stuff just available. Right. Um, so I I've never written a book. I'd love to. Right. I have bits and pieces of this and that here and there, like probably a whole lot of people. And so I assume you uh -huh. wrote the actually wrote the book that just came out uh, a while ago. So what's your next book? What's what's kind of your next? Uh, I don't know. That's probably a terrible thing to ask. As your oh, God, your, your I, book just came out this month, right? I don't know. Yeah, the book just came out like two weeks ago. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So I'm like, I should recall I'm, that question. I'm fully into. Uh, I'm fully into micro interact. Yeah, you know, everyone laughs. And says, oh, the next book's going to be macro interactions. Yeah, there you that's, go. That's the obvious joke. Um, but no, I I I haven't really thought about it yet. I okay. mean, I've I've been thinking about a book on like uh, 
creative direction and stuff like that, but uh, no, nothing is nothing is set yet. Nothing it's, is set yet. Yeah, no, it's 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 enough to get this book out and launched. Okay. And, and, talking about it so let's give a little plug to the book so i, I assume people can get it uh as they say wherever books yeah, are sold where, or wherever books are sold on online and uh and in and in bookstores microinteractions.com is the is the url you can get a uh a chapter and a half download there for free and okay and is it it's out right now right it's so, out right now so if you go it's, to go to uh barnes and noble or books inc or wherever you get down to the show you find dan tomorrow I bet you he'll sign it. That's right. Is that, for, is that a deal? Exactly. And for people here, I'm doing a book signing uh, in about half hour. Oh, uh, there you go. So uh, you got time. I'm, I'm, we'll have to. We could check your Google Maps to find out where Ex the local exactly. store is exactly. and get your map. Well, Dan, thanks for coming on. It's, it's sure. you know, the technology is always interesting, but at the end of the day, people have to use it. And uh, again, I go back to my VCR flashing 12 days. Technology is not always easy to use if you're over the age of 30. It, right. it is fascinating that kids are so uh, easily able to discover functionality and and it's important because people put a lot of time and effort into these devices you pay a lot of money for them they can do a lot of things right. but you know how do you do it and, and design is such an important piece and somewhere there is still that flashing 12 in yes. the dark many of them many of them many of them so. i had nightmares about them <laughs> i could tell you stories and then uh, right. but we won't go there so dan thanks for stopping by the queue appreciate thanks it thanks for having me so we're again at um o'reilly fluent conference at the hilton hotel in san francisco wrapping up uh day one here as we come to a close we'll be here all day tomorrow so you can watch the uh interviews live at silicon angle.com and we will have them up shortly on the website at youtube.com slash silicon angle which will have the playlist of all the interviews again we go out to the events we bring you the smartest people we can find we ask them hopefully the questions that you would ask them if you were here extract the signal from the noise and really hopefully give you a flavor and a and feel for what's going on at the conference so we will uh, be back in one minute for our wrap <laughs>